Mount Everest is the ultimate dream for most mountaineers. Many go through years of training and prior climbing experiences just to prepare themselves for such a peak. The reason is simple. Mount Everest is the tallest peak in the world with an elevation of 8,849 meters above sea level. The long climb spans over multiple days, exposing you to some of the most brutal conditions possible. There is no denying that reaching the summit marks a significant achievement in many people's lives. However, climbing Mount Everest certainly has a price. In 2023, 17 climbers died on Everest, nine of which happened in May alone. Today, we will focus on two of these climbers, both at different stages in life, but on the mountain at the same time. This is their story. In the past, the expectation when you attempted an Everest summit was that you were a strong, self-sufficient climber with experience that could handle most situations. However, in recent years, we clearly see that in some cases, this is no longer true. Instead, third-party expedition companies can advertise their Everest trips by needing little to no experience as they will guide you step by step to the summit, as long as they are well paid, of course. The reasons why this is dangerous are quite obvious, as more and more inexperienced climbers attempt to summit Everest. This has certainly led to controversy building up in the community, and there is no better example than 59-year-old Indian teacher Suzanne Leopoldina Jesus. With record-breaking climbing permits granted for expeditions, Suzanne, a part of the Glacier Himalayan Trek, would travel to Nepal and from there Everest Base Camp in early May. Camp would be busy, to say the least, as there were over 47 different teams, all trying to reach the top. Typically, summit bids have to be shared across multiple expeditions, as the weather will only permit a few good days at high altitudes, which understandably causes long lines to build up in various locations. The weather in May fluctuated greatly on Everest, but the conditions would slightly improve as the month went on. The temperature would hover around 27 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 2 degrees Celsius, and there would be stray storms that brought snowfall, adding to the risk of avalanches. Visibility was great if it was not snowing, and these would be the times that climbers had to take advantage of. In preparation for her summit bid, Suzanne, like most climbers, would begin with acclimatization trips, which consists of traveling to a higher altitude point, resting, and allowing your body to become used to these conditions before returning back to your starting location. Normally, this is repeated multiple times and is not only useful for climbers, but it is also helpful to provide information to the expedition leaders. On acclimatization trips, Sherpas can see firsthand how clients will respond in different situations. And it is safe to say that there were very concerning signs for Suzanne. Accompanied by a Sherpa in the first week of May, they would take their first acclimatization trip, but would not make it far as Suzanne struggled to make it past Crompton Point, a location 250 meters above Everest Base Camp. Normally, it would take an experienced mountaineer 20 minutes to reach this location. However, it took Suzanne over five hours on her first try. Not wanting to give up, she would attempt the traverse again a few days later, but this time, it would take her six hours. It became clear to the Sherpas that Suzanne would not be fit to climb Everest. They were honest with her and heavily warned against continuing but she would not listen. At the age of 59, Suzanne had a dream of becoming the first Asian woman to summit Everest with a pacemaker. It would state that she had to climb the peak as the fee for acquiring permission had already been paid in full. There is no record of Suzanne having any climbing experience other than receiving confirmation that she completed an Everest base camp hike the year before in 2022. Working as a teacher in one of the largest government schools in Silvasa, India, it appears as though she led a very normal lifestyle. Suzanne was not overly active, and it is clear she did not have the necessary experience for a mountain like Everest. Despite all this, the 59-year-old teacher would not take no for an answer and would participate in her third acclimation trip during the second week of May. They started in the morning, there were a few clouds, but nothing too worrisome. 
Hours would tick by as the sun burned over them moving across the sky. Each step, you could hear the crunch of white snow under boots. By the time they had reached Crompton Point, 12 hours had passed. Six hours slower than her previous time, and by far the worst time yet. A very concerning sign was that Suzanne was not showing any progress, in fact quite the opposite. Each attempt, her times have increased, indicating she was not improving, but rather declining. After this trip, Suzanne reported issues with her throat and stated that she found it very challenging to swallow food. On top of that, she had started to develop a cold and was beginning to feel sick. It was clear to her Sherpa a more direct approach was needed and thus they had a conversation where Suzanne was told word for word that if she continued, she would die. It's hard to understand what was going through her head at this moment. Despite being told such a harrowing thought and against all advice given to her, she refused to leave base camp, determined to climb Everest at any cost. Unfortunately, at this point, Suzanne was becoming a safety risk to not only herself but to those around her as well. Her condition rapidly deteriorated as the sickness was becoming worse each day. Suzanne would begin her Everest attempt on May 17th, but there is not much to be said about this, as she would only make it 500 meters above base camp before having to stop. The Sherpa with Suzanne had seen enough, and strongly against her wishes, called in a helicopter to have her evacuated. Even though she had not made much progress, her condition had gotten so bad, she could no longer climb down from their location. When the helicopter arrived, Suzanne refused to go, and had to be forcibly removed from the mountain. She was in such a bad state, they flew her directly to Lukla, a small town in northeastern Nepal for medical assistance, where she would receive care all night, but unfortunately at 5 a.m. on May 18th, was pronounced dead. Her body would be transported to Kathmandu for an autopsy to further learn more, and from there, family would take over. This story is truly unique, because in the past seasons on Everest, there would have never been an inexperienced climber like Suzanne. Being the tallest mountain in the world, many look at it as some sort of challenge. A box on a piece of paper that can be checked off by a pencil. But if you don't take the mountain seriously, it's not a matter of if a similar story like Suzanne's will occur. It's only a matter of when. It was hard for Malaysian climber Ag Askandar Bin Ampun Yakup to hide his excitement as he arrived at Everest Base Camp in early May. Originally from Kampung Benoni Papar Sabah, he served as a Malaysian police officer and lived a relatively active lifestyle. The 55-year-old was a family man with a loving wife and six children who he thought the world of. After work, most of Jakob's time was spent actively playing with his kids, and on special occasions, he would be seen bringing a child to work with him. Jakob certainly lived a healthy lifestyle, maybe more so than your average individual, but his major mountaineering experience was very limited. He had attempted to climb Everest before, but was unsuccessful. Jakob was a known extreme sports enthusiast, but not particularly for climbing, more so scuba diving and parachuting. Whether for the challenge or just the experience, Jakob traveled to Everest, where he would be joining the Nepali Pioneer Adventures Expedition. As soon as they arrived, the team began acclimation climbs, where despite his age, Jakob was able to do well. He certainly was not the fastest, but could hold his own, and the Sherpas were not too concerned with him attempting for the summit. However, However, the weather changed rapidly during the first two weeks of May, as a big storm would creep on the mountain. Some days were spent doing the necessary preparations and acclimation trips, while on other days visibility would be so poor that you were lucky to get anything done. Jakob did his best to become accustomed to the conditions, where he faced on average negative 2 degrees Celsius or 27 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. After the initial two weeks, the acclimation trips were finished and the team was finally preparing for the summit push. The weather would clear around May 15th, and many expeditions would take advantage and start their climbs. Each climber had to be considerate of each other as the space is limited, especially the higher up you climb. The Pioneer Adventures team would begin their climb at this time, as well following the popular South Call route. Over the next few days, they made steady progress up the mountain. The sky stayed clear, except for a stray floating cloud, and the bright sun rays bounced off the snow onto Jakob's face. 
His breathing grew heavy as he climbed higher and higher. On May 18th, right before the sun set, they had reached the location of Camp 4, right around 8,000 meters. Heaps of trash and empty oxygen bottles were left scattered on the ground, frustrating all the climbers that saw this, but there was little they could personally do to fix the issue. The buildup of trash being left over from all the different expeditions on Everest is a growing problem that is not being addressed well. The most impacted areas are obviously base camp and surprisingly the higher altitude camps. But there have been recent reports of trash being thrown into crevasses as it is an easier solution than bringing it down the mountain. Jakob and the team settled in for the night and got some much needed rest as they had a big day ahead of them. On May 19th, they awoke before the sun had risen in the sky as the anticipation in the group was steadily building. Today was the day for their summit push. They started their climb, but it was not long before the group noticed something was wrong with Jakob. His progress was slower, and he needed to take more breaks, but this was not much of a worrying sign, and actually made sense because they were well into the death zone. This just means that above a certain point in altitude, around 8,000 meters, is where the level of oxygen is insufficient to sustain human life for an extended time span. Despite not feeling as well as he could, Jakob would keep climbing for hours until he eventually reached the South Summit, a popular location for climbers to rest. Now, the South Summit of Everest is about 130 meters away from the official summit, but in order to reach it, you have to climb down about 11 meters. From there, do the Cornish Traverse, which is a single ledge sitting on a high altitude point between two sides that many climbers have to traverse, followed by passing the famous Hillary Step and on to the official summit. The sun was almost directly above him, but Jakob could not find the strength to move. He was becoming easily confused, and it became clear to those around him that he was developing altitude sickness. The Sherpas and crew members around him recognized that they needed to act fast in order to give Jakob the best chance of survival. Unfortunately, to bring someone down the mountain from the death zone is very tricky, and multiple Sherpas had to be involved, which took some time to organize. But after about an hour, they were ready to go and began descending. The goal was to reach Camp 4 as fast as possible and get Jakob out of the death zone. Each step they moved closer and closer to safety. It was a race against time as the Sherpas continued to carry Jakob down the mountain. They would check on him every so often, but before reaching Camp 4, he would become unresponsive. Unfortunately, he would never make it back and was pronounced dead on Everest. His body would be left somewhere in the South Coal region, where it was retrieved the next day. His family would receive the body back in Malaysia, where he now rests in his hometown. Suzanne and Jakob were two completely different individuals, but both with dreams of climbing the tallest mountain in the world, yet they died only a day apart. Their stories truly highlight their growing concerns in the mountaineering community of the amount of permits granted and who they are being granted to. There is no doubt that more regulations are needed, but at the end of the day, money talks the loudest. <laughs>